enough to be punctual. And uh, OK, so a very warm welcome to everybody to our second Bremen AI data launch. We have an exciting topic today to talk about, which is stated to be the seven deadly sins of applied machine learning and finance, or maybe any other industry. And today's speaker will be Dr. Luis Moreira Matias, uh, head of data science at Monedo, which was formerly known as Credit Tech. Uh, I think he will say something to himself later on. So I will uh, just say that this is our speaker and he I'm, I'm very, very excited to have him here. Uh, he's a very special person uh, and I think we can learn a lot from him throughout this talk. So we have the second Bremen AI data launch, uh, but we have the first uh, fully online event. So please mute your microphones that we don't have any disturbing noise throughout the talk. Um, and if you want to ask questions, uh, do it via the chat uh, functionality. You have this bar in the middle of the screen when you hover the mouse over, and there you have a chat, the, sh the conversation um, uh, the conversation button, and there you can ask questions. Uh, Louis will tell you if it's okay to ask questions throughout the talk or afterwards. So I'm very sad to say that we today, uh, as usual, we don't have any beer and don't have any pizza that we can serve you. So I hope you prepared well for this evening and brought some beer and pizza yourself. Um, and another hint, this uh, session will be recorded. So uh, afterwards, you can also visit it at YouTube and uh, watch it again if you missed a part or have to leave early. So for those who are here for the first time, let me just quickly introduce uh, what you will be facing. So and who is basically the actors behind this meetup. So first of all, let me introduce Bremen AI. So Bremen AI is the official cluster for artificial intelligence here in Bremen, and it strives to bring together academia on one hand side and the industry on the one, uh, other hand side. So its goal is to strengthen uh, Bremen as an AI location. And in order to do so, it regularly uh, sets up events like the Bremen AI main event, and also some smaller ones like different meetups with different uh, specifications. Uh, and the data launch uh, that we have today is one of it. Uh, the data launch itself, the Bremen AI, uh, the data launch um, meetup exists since April 2018, I guess. Uh, that's where we started it the first time. And it strives also to bring the community together, uh, but not uh, specifically around uh, artificial intelligence, but more broadly on every data related topic, maybe data visualization, data science, or data engineering. So on the beginning, beginning of 2020, we put it, the efforts together to uh, have some synergies. And here we are uh, in our second Bremen AI data launch. And again, this is a, a very, a very um, special event, not only because we have the first fully online meetup, but also because we are co-hosting this event with the Diginomics Research Group from the University of Bremen. And therefore, I want to hand over to Professor Lars Hornhoff, uh, who is a member of that group, and he will introduce what they are doing. And uh, that's your turn right now. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Sven. So uh, thanks for the uh, kind handover. Um, indeed, uh, now that you presented uh, Bremen AI, I think uh, you're doing uh, pretty much uh, similar things that, that we are doing more from the academic side, I would say. And uh, so I give you a brief intro about the uh, Digenomics Group. Uh, so the Digenomics Group is an initiative of the Faculty of Business Studies and Economics at the University of Bremen, uh, which started in 2018. Uh, what we are doing is that we examine research questions related to digitalization of labor markets, capital markets, product markets, and uh, what economists uh, usually do. Um, our faculty has defined 12 uh, research focuses, as part of which uh, graduate students are uh, jointly investigating with their supervisors economic, but also moral and uh, psychological research questions that all have an emphasis on uh, digital markets uh, in some sense and how they relate uh, to the economy and businesses uh, in general. Uh, we investigate these topics usually using state-of-the-art uh, empirical and experimental methods, so it must not be all uh, AI-driven, but uh, 
we apply whatever state of the art method is, is, is currently available. And uh, we are also doing mostly basic research uh, and to seek to provide policy advice later on to regional, national and uh, supranational uh, legislators. Uh, the research focuses deal with questions related to artificial intelligence, blockchains, uh, chatbots, digital finance and platform economics. And with the format of the digital digi genomics research talks, what we are trying to do is uh, we try to bring academic research uh, together with uh, the use and practice. And I think our keynote speaker today, Luis Moreira and Matias, is really one of uh, the ideal persons to deliver such a speech because he's not only the head of uh, data science at Monedo, which was formerly uh, Qualitech, uh, which is probably one of the most interesting, but uh, also would consider it uh, one of the most uh, controversial fintechs in, in Germany. Uh, but he is also, uh, or he also pursued an academic career. So he actually unifies the two things uh, that we are looking for uh, in a perfect manner. So uh, Louis received a PhD in computer, computer science with a focus on machine learning from the University of Porto, uh, where he worked from 2009 to 2015, exploring and developing machine learning algorithms over data streams collected through public transportation networks. He also received an MSc in information, uh, informatics, engineering and computer science. Um, and I also learned that he visited uh, TU Dortmund uh, during a summer term. Um, so he has some relation to or had some relation to Germany before. And thereafter, he uh, was a senior um, researcher at uh, NEC uh, Europe. He worked for Edvault, and uh, since 2018, uh, he leads a data science team at Monedo, developing state-of-the-art machine learning pipelines for credit scoring, pricing, and affordability. And today, he will talk about the seven deadly sins of applied machine learning in finance or maybe any other industry. And I think this is really uh, something where, where academics and practitioners should be um, yeah, very much interested in because um, now that we see, for instance, with the coronavirus, how important academia becomes, I think that the title deadly sins, uh, I think becomes even more relevant because uh, not only in, in medicine, but also any other discipline, it might not become that obvious, but uh, if you're not granted a loan, or if you get a loan, it can really change your life uh, forever. And so I'm very much looking forward uh, to um, to the talk. And uh, so, Luis, uh, the, the floor is yours. And uh, uh, thank you very much for being here. So thank you. Thank you, Lars. Thank you, Sven. So I need just to. So. Are you guys seeing my screen right now? The presentation, everything good? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, okay, perfect, perfect. So again, thank you lots of very kind introduction. And I would like to thank you to Bremen.ai cluster and the University of, of Bremen, in particular the genomics group for the very kind invitation to, to be here today, it's a pleasure. And as last point out, I'm here to, to to give my talk entitled The Seven Deadly Sins of Applied Machine Learning and AI in Finance, which I believe that to be to be applicable to each and every other industry. Um, you, I think you understand better why I think so during the presentation. So I divided, I, I struck this presentation in two parts. The first part where I connect the, the, the well-known seven deadly sins uh, to issues, pr practical issues of applying machine learning um, in finance. And the se second part where I talk about the, the achievements and how my team uh, in Monedo is overcoming some of these issues with, with the, the, the proprietary technology that we develop in-house. I'll try to keep this talk as much universal uh, as possible in terms of audience, which means that uh, the first part will be very high level, talking a lot about business and the terms that uh, everybody will understand, even if they don't have uh, technical background on, on data science. The second part will be indeed a little bit more technical. I will still make an effort to, to make it understandable by, by, by a larger audience, okay? So in terms of, of protocol for, for questions, uh, I would say if something 
to make to make the, there is there is a natural uh, division between the two parts. So if something we can be open to some questions in the the middle of uh, on the end of one of the parts, and then and then in the end of the presentation, of course. Okay, so I guess that uh, Sven will uh, let me know uh, if there are questions at that point. Okay, I'll give some seconds there, and uh, if uh, if not, I'll go till the end of presentation, and then then we have the questions there. Okay, so without further delays, um, I will start. So these are the themes that you guys already know uh, uh, about and then below we have some some of the issues that i would like to talk and i'll start with one that um, it's very uh, characteristic of our era gluttony and the talk about the concept of data gluttony okay so nowadays you see many senior leaders um, and executives uh, defending in pitches pretty much around the globe and uh, across multiple industries, including finance, that, that there is a very strong value proposition out there to be explored. So we have, for one side, we have a, a inexpensive, affordable cloud computing uh, resources. On the other side, you have AI methods. Okay, here personified on the, the this image, this robot that I call Bob, so a, a random machine learning library method and function, and then you have digital data. And so the idea is simple, right? So so we have these cloud computers, uh, because cloud computers are hosting Bob, you feed all the data to, that you have to, to Bob, and Bob basically will change the world, will change your world, okay? So we'll make you would turn your sales figures to increase 30 percent will we'll, uh, make your business um, will more robust will more will stronger okay and this is very this is very unrealistic uh, this is unrealistic due to multiple reasons at least unrealistic nowadays to do multiple reasons but one of the reasons that i picked it the time dependency okay um, so time, uh, there are many businesses that are, um, I would say, very, very strong dependent on time. If you think about retail, for instance, okay, so you have the demand patterns change a lot with time, change with particular events. If you see now the, the COVID crisis that happened on the Western world started around March. So it changed the, the, the demand for some products that you thought that would never uh, run out of stocks and they run such as toilet paper. Okay. So, but you can also see these on other more classical time dynamics such as season, month, week, day, hour, and these dynamics, let's say, they don't cope, cope well with the maths, the traditional maths assumptions behind the methods that constitute the backbone of what is nowadays the mainstream machine learning methods, and machine learning is the backbone of what is mainstream AI uh, uh, nowadays. So, so I, w without getting too technical, I pick up here two, uh, two of these uh, assumptions that uh, are classically posed. One is this very nice acronym, IID, which uh, stands for Independent and Identically Distributed Variables. And without explaining what this actually uh, means, uh, you can imagine that this means that, for instance, if you are, uh, they're, they're getting an example from the financial world, a credit scorecard. So if you are trying to model the probability of default of a customer, uh, in function of a series of, of decision variables, okay, it's common to assume that these decision variables are independent among themselves, so they have no relationship. But then when you go in practice, okay, so two of the most common decision variables that you look at will be a credit bureau rating, okay, and will be the monthly income of the individual. And uh, you, these are two very different concepts, right? But if you look closely, so someone that has a high uh, credit bureau rating, okay, um, will be likely to have a high income as well. So not always, but, but this is likely to be in place. So that means that there is a link, there is a relationship, okay, that violates this exemption. Same thing happens with the stationary distribution. So the stationary distributions means that the concept that we are trying to, to model with a mathematical expression, 
uh, is constant over time, does it not mutate over time? Okay, so if you think about, if you are modeling stock prices, okay, and they think about trying to predict which is the stock price of company A today, um, you look at, let's say that company A stock price will depend on today, will depend on the stock price of company B and C in the last couple, in the last, let's say, seven days. Okay. And this is expected to be uh, stable over time, this relationship. And as we, we know very well, uh, this is, is, is very unrealistic. So th th these type of limitations that currently today AI methods have, they happen because, because they are designed to solve a set of tasks that are very restricted on the solution space and very restricted on the problem they actually are trying to solve. And they don't comprise actually a path to universal or conscious artificial intelligence. So uh, Bob here actually doesn't exist. We are very far away of having Bob very excited that you just throw data in and you get, you get uh, business uplift out. Okay. The second scene I want to talk is rot and the, our rot with the law. Okay. So typically, if you are, if you are uh, a southern like myself, I, I, I don't like very much rules. So I know that I need to follow, but I, I don't like it. Don't like them. And if you think about uh, creating a startup, the last thing you want to think about is legislation. Okay. So you don't have, no, you, what you have, you have passion, you have enthusiasm, and you have an idea. Okay. And you have an idea typically driven, let's say, by AI or machine learning. Okay. So you need to figure out how to get data. Um, you need to get a garage and call a couple of friends. And let's 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 do it, right? So and then you start. You have something more mature. You have a prototype. You start. You have the POC somehow. You start having some customers and you start having some promising, ever-growing numbers. Okay, and Series A and Series B investors love you. Okay, and this is the classical story of many uh, startups out there. And then uh, what happens is you cre start creating some buzzes, get prize of these and prize of that, get off on the media. And at this time is when regulators come and ask and start making questions. So they start asking you um, how, how you collect your data, which data you collect, what you used for, how you store it, how you process it. But more even, so how you ensure on your process that you protect the privacy of your customers or how you ensure that then your process don't have a bias, a gender bias or, or a bias of ethnicity or, or other type of unfair bias, for instance, when you are talking about lending. But this is like, this is something that typically uh, very affects very regulated uh, areas such as healthcare, finance, insurance, uh, also law enforcement or, or, or even recruitment agencies, okay? Um, and nowadays, after GDPR, started affecting pretty much each and every business, okay? So you have to pay attention how you manage your data. And of course, that the story that you tell, the classic uh, entrepreneur will say, yeah, well, we, have, we do AI, so we have here some data we collect, and then we feed out on a model, the model then as an output. Okay, so nobody knows exactly how the model reached to this output because the model is very accurate. This model is very accurate. It tends to be very complex. Uh, if it's very complex, it's difficult to interpret. Of course, you can do a simpler model, but simpler model will not get you business as um, it, will not, it will tend not to be very accurate. And if you try to sell the idea to regulate that, yeah, well, we started with a very complex model, but now you came and perhaps, yeah, we agree it's a good idea to have um, a simpler one in place that you guys can interpret and can monitor and track. They will turn to you. Remember, regulators most of the time are not very, um, are not tech people. Okay, so they look to you and say, this guy is trying to fraud me. And eventually what happens is that you get fined, or you get shut down because you run out of sponsors. And um, because in the end, everybody fears what they cannot control, neither understand. So the message I want to pass here is that if you are trying to kick out a business, um, more than have a very solid business plan with AI in each and every slide, uh, 
uh, you also have to have a, a data strategy plan, a data governance plan, okay? So that, that thinks about which are the implications for your business of starting leveraging certain type of data or starting leveraging on certain type of models that will have in 18 months, in 24 months, when you actually achieve the scale and you are not leveraging on the models, but you are dependent on them, okay? The first thing I want to talk is pride. And the pride we bring here, we bring here the scale. Um, this is another issue that uh, is transversal to our society. We are taught throughout mass media and so on that large is good, big is great, and great is amazing. Okay, so so it's good to be big. It's good to be large. Okay, so we even have this this uh, uh, slogan from uh, the. the, the American president when he was running to on his first uh, his first run for the president is that uh, let's make America great again. So be great is be good. It's good. It's good to be great, right? So and some years ago, it is already some years. It's I think 2016. Uh, digital reasoning is a, a startup. A I startup in US um, won the Guinness record for the largest neural network that was ever constructed by then. This neural network had 160 billion of synapses, okay, which corresponds off to 0.16%, which the uh, average human brain would have. Now, I'm not tracking uh, digital reasoning. I don't know how much success they had or not, but I wonder, but I, the fact is I kept not hearing much about them. One of the reasons why I believe so is because I really believe that size doesn't matter, okay? And it's just a matter of pride. So accuracy does, but as any other business, in AI, AI is no different. Accuracy does based on the amount of resources that you have to employ in order to reach that accuracy. And to illustrate this example, I brought here this idea. I brought here an example from one of these technical blogs that you find online, it's Stack Overflow, about uh, a data scientist that had this built this beautiful neural network that was able to achieve an accuracy of 99.95% uh, on, on a, some image prediction task that he was interested on, uh, some application. Uh, but then he uh, states that, yeah, okay, I trained this, I have this accuracy, but then I cannot use it. Because even on a super powerful computer in the cloud, this network takes uh, 0.5 seconds to be able to classify 10 images, okay? Which for my application is a very, very long time. If I take uh, a normal laptop, uh, like the laptop that most of you have for work, this will take 1.2 seconds, okay? Which is huge time. So I cannot put this in production. I cannot make this work for my business. Um, and if you are wondering, okay, what is the business value of this model? I can tell you right away that it's zero. Okay, so so the performance of a model is a trade-off between the accuracy that it has versus the resources that you need it needs to train it and put it running in production, keep it running in production. And when I talk about resources, I talk about human resources, but also uh, computational ones, obviously. Um, then. I'll talk to you about slot and slot again in the business sense. Okay. A slot again, thinking about the concept of automated industry. Okay. Of one button machine, which you press and uh, finds a way of providing uh, a service for your customers that actually what it is, is moving money from your customer's pockets into your account while you are drinking a margarita in the near speech. Um, of course, this is a, uh, uh, Another fallacy, we are, we are still very far away from that, but many leaders confuse this, this notion of automation, digitalization. They, they, they say that, well, okay, we are already digital, so we are uh, already at the verge of automation. And, and that, that couldn't be uh, less true, right? So if, if I think about that staircase, staircase to have a fully automated, um, decision process and the fully auto, even a fully automated business, there are several steps that you have to go to. First, it helps if you are agile, then it's, of course, it's mandatory that you become digital, but then it's, you have to have your processes go data-driven, 
then perhaps there is a stage where you go bottled even and finally you reach automation. Okay. So and I believe that many companies are not even available to go these stairs, okay, to be candid and even to understand what that means in terms of their, their management style, which is many times uh, looking behind where these classic waterfalls and these midterm, free year midterm plans, which is are not very compatible with the, the data economy and the, the these data-driven processes that we are uh, we I'm emphasizing here, and many businesses, even if digital, they rely on end users manual data entry, either by um, their customers or by low-income employees. Okay, so uh, guess what? So so customers are lazy. Customers what they they don't care about your company. They care about getting the best possible user experience with the minimum possible effort. Okay, and this leads to mistakes. So if you think like the classic example, and I give you my example, when I want to buy some device, I go to Idealo, I search for a device and I find which is the cheapest uh, e-commerce website that can, can get this technic device for me. And then obviously when you are going to do a purchase there, they will always pursue you somehow to do a registration. Okay, and to pass some information on the form, uh, and obviously, uh, I most of the time I I don't want it because what I want is to buy the product at the cheapest uh, price as possible. So I fill the form uh, the fastest I can, and that will go with mistakes. Okay, um, and these mistakes um, they they are errors on that affect you, uh, many people would say that, okay, this is creates some noise on your data and noise can be good. Some mach in machine learning, there are uh, some methods which I say that they cope well if the data is noisy, okay? Uh, and that's true, yes, but however, it's only true if these noise, if these errors happen at random and they often, they don't. Okay, they don't happen at random. So again, if you think about the form example, let's say that you are filling a form where you have to put your employment status or not employment status, no, your profession. And uh, you have a combo box with different options, let's say 30 options for your profession. Okay, I'm sure that you already saw a form like this. And uh, this form has like two free options that are ambiguous, they are somehow overlapping and ambiguously close to what you actually do, okay? One one of them better than the others. But guess what? You, most of the time, what will happen, you open this combo box and you select the first that you see, which is top, typically the first that is on the top because you need to scroll down to see all the options that you don't want to do that. So these options, the order of the options there, will induce a bias on the way you select the profession that then will induce a bias on uh, our model. And this, this, this error on data entry don't happen at random. They happen because due to the order that you have on your combo box. And this can generate a butterfly effect that in the end will create the data quality issues that will make your model to underperform. And guess what? these type of mistakes are underlooked because they are not sexy at all okay so 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 let's say so it's not sex to say hey you know what i fixed the order of the the professions in the combo box and that made my model to my scorecard let's say what is in the context of of banking my credit scorecard to perform better next month no what people would like to say uh, is okay i trained the new a new neural network with dozens of millions of synapses and that uh, it's improved my scorecard and that that is that is why the business is driving better and especially if you think about mid-sized uh, mid-sized organizations the narrative that okay my my machine learning model is underperforming in the business because you know, the front end team didn't design very well the form. This is very, very hard to stick. It's very hard to fly. Um, but it, at the same time, it's actually true. So what happens is this, this is not handled properly. The root cause of this, this underperformance is not handled properly. And in the meanwhile, uh, your company is losing euros. Okay. So again, uh, here I talk about grid. 
and the greed of the customers, okay, and especially in the banking uh, in the banking world, okay, uh, customers care simply about their own goals. Unfairly, okay, they want low or no banking fees at all. They want low mortgage interest. They want to get a large payday loan, no matter what. And the customers are unreliable to give their own data. Okay, so so they try to picture the nicest picture of themselves. And is this, is that real? No. <laughs> okay, so if they know they increase their chance of getting a better condition of on a mortgage or uh, uh, of get a loan uh, by slightly increasing the, their their stated income. They will do that. Okay, same way that probably many of you I don't know, but I imagine so that for instance many of you in, when filling your tax declaration, uh, you can look to the invoice and say, okay, this invoice here will really not exactly what would fit this category, but I will try it out, okay? And that's the same thing with the customers here to apply for a loan. Okay, this income, I just receive it two times a year with the bonus, but I'll put it, uh, let's try it out. This is what we call like soft fraud, okay? And of course, soft fraud in real world and also from from all perspectives, also uh, criminal procedures and, and so on, it's very far away from art fraud. And by art fraud, I'm meaning credit card cloning, phishing attacks, impersonification, forged documents. And th this is something that can really harm your day-to-day -day, uh, operations. Um, however, if you look from a data perspective, let me tell you a secret. Soft fraud and art fraud will look the same. Okay, we look like abnormal examples, and your models will tend to pick up on them. Okay, to try to understand why these examples are there and how you can model and not ignore them because they are abnormal, but try to find a pattern there that actually doesn't exist. Okay, so it's just like forged or like some some attempt for a customer to to counter the rules. Um. Now, lust, lust or vanity, okay, in being a data scientist. So, so, so nowadays we find a world that everybody thinks that they can be a data scientist, and everybody wants to be a data scientist, um, and everybody thinks that to be a data scientist is better. So, the data science say, hey, program. I'm not a programming. I'm a data scientist. I do analysis. I don't do code. I do machine learning models. Uh, I don't do heuristics. Um, so, so the science sometimes the time in the market they judge to be better than, for instance, the classical programmer. But from a business stakeholder point of view, and rightfully, they are the same. They are a technical resource. Um, this is it's very visible even the world nowadays. So even the recruitment agencies are still very focused on technologies and on technological keywords. So to search, uh, okay, well, such a data science that is an expert in Python, that is an expert in Scala, that is uh, a two years experience of TensorFlow, very, very focused on technologies like would be with the software uh, engineering. But in true, uh, data science is slightly different, okay? And the most important tool to define data science is their brain, their ability to connect the dots between business requirements, uh, the data that the company has available, and the mathematical tools and the other technical tools that exist out there that will help us help them to to solve their problems and to 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 strengthen their their their, their business. Um, the, to strengthen their company business and the value proposition of their company uh, overall. So these people that are capable of doing that, these are very, very rare resources and very, very hard to find and then to retain. Okay, And this is what I call the professional data scientist or, or even better, the true data science, so so-called so unicorn. That these guys, if you are these guys, I believe that in your, if your organization is mature enough uh, from a data-driven point of having uh, digital data and having data-driven decisions, these guys can do a lot for your business. And uh, on the other hand, 
the others, I call them to be citizen data scientists. So, so, so people that can understand data science frameworks, they can even put them in production, but they typically they lack either the, the, the big picture in terms of business or the ability to understand how these frameworks really work inside uh, so they can fine tune them to the problem at hand. Okay, these people are also important. They have their space, but I wouldn't say they would be mo add more value than a software programmer. And depending what language the programmer is uh, is doing, they, it can be even more valuable. Okay, that these 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 people. So their their vanity is overrated, and you need to know exactly. So on your company, uh, you need to know in which stage are you and which type of data science you are looking at. Um, and then look also to be ready to say, okay, perhaps I just need citizen data scientists and then I can stay on the lower end of the, the, the salary band. Or at this moment, I really need an unicorn and then have to be ready to, to invest and to, to get the returns uh, later. Okay, but to give these people, uh, um, uh, put these people on a salary range that is uh, actually competitive for, with their talent. And the final scene will be the envy, of course. And envy, I put here, envy connected with machine learning uh, because it's envy for the neighbor with machine learning. So uh, many companies nowadays have in their business plans to have machine learning. To, to, they, they do this to follow a hype, okay? So, so, so many companies even have AI on the name. You see, name of the company, dot .ai. I always wonder myself, um, and no offense to these companies, that why you do that? Okay, so so if you are really doing AI, why you need to have uh, .ai on the name? Okay, it's something that I always uh, uh, doesn't give me the click, uh, but it, it's, it's it's obvious. I understand why because it sells for both both for 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 the investors for for their stakeholders, but it, it's actually to follow a hype. And the, this hype is a little bit like the, the teenage sex in high school class type of hype. So everybody wonders that they can do it. Everybody thinks that the others are doing it, but then actually nobody is, is, is actually doing it. Okay, this is valid for startups, okay, that do the so-called PowerPoint AI. So you have a very nice slide, a very nice business plan. You have AI written everywhere. But then in reality, what they are doing is some analytical dashboards. They have perhaps some forecasting models there, some customer segmentation that then is used for, for some, 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 some things, some reports, or to forecast some KPIs on financials, but which things that are very far away from the true value proposition of, of the company, okay? The same thing is valid for big corporations, and now I'll be touching um, an industry that is very, very popular here in Germany, which is the, the automotive industry, which also is all, a lot like talking about AI race and a lot of competition. But nowadays, when you go to a car stand and you look to a car, you... And you decide that can, you are able to dissect which are the technology behind this car. You first understand that this car has almost no AI. Uh, no machine learning model is, 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 is running there, actually. Okay, perhaps you can recognize pedestrians. That is a nice to have function. Perhaps you have a nice cruise control, which can, can help you on relaxing a little bit on the highway. But these, these are not really so uh, machine learning models, right? So, so it's not it's heuristics, and, and more important than that, it's not the value proposition of this company. So you typically will not buy the car because it has these 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 functions, okay? And especially will not pay the price of the car. No, their value proposition is to manufacture vehicles, and for X, and then sell it by two X or three X or even more. Okay, so this is AI is something still very esoteric for what actually makes the dollar count in the end of the day. So that posed the question, like many companies, AI is not there. And the message that I want to pass with this slide that perhaps AI doesn't need to be there at all. Okay, so, so perhaps not everybody should be doing it. So you have to... to, to 
to use machine learning to automate your business, you need to have the right data, the right scientists, the right infrastructure, pose the right business questions, I would add even in the right time, and then to understand beforehand what will come after, what will be the implications of making such shift, okay? And live with them, okay? So we talked about the legal implications, but there are others, okay? So this is, again, very important that you know that you are doing it. You have a data strategy in place from the very, very, very beginning following your, your business plan um, in order for you to know exactly where are you going and you utilize data and not to stay dependent on or data hostage. Okay, that's another expression that is out there. And actually, what I believe that still happens nowadays is the reality is, is, is reality. So I pull here a sentence that was said to me by a customer of a company that uh, organization that I used to, to be aff affiliated with in the past, uh, which is this home transit agency, which told me that we have tons of data, but we are not able to use machine learning, neither to hire experts to do it so. And I believe these still what happens in many organizations, both from public and private sector. Okay. And even if you have machine learning models in production to automate your business, so you will be scaling this mountain that is here uh, defined by, by Gartner and uh, you will want to reach this quadrant when you have predictive analytics or, or prescriptive analytics. You have to be ready to deal with the so-called bias loop. Okay. So, so if you have these machine learning models taking decisions for you, like we have in Monedo, um, there will be a bias induced on your data collection process that if you don't deal with it well, would hurt your business. And the, when you talk about bias, just to make it more clear uh, for the, all the audience, let's talk about an example, for instance, bias in gender, okay? Um, I take this example that I have here from the left, I have, we have this, uh, want to build a system, an AI system that is able to say what is the activity that is being done on a picture, if it is, for instance, cooking or reading. And it's provided with a series of examples, that's a series of images that are labeled, okay, uh, before. And in these images, from all the images that uh, are labeled as cooking, 60% of these images are women. Okay, then when the algorithm learns uh, how to do the prediction, and then when you feed the algorithm with uh, queries, with the new data, 84% um, of the time that the algorithm predicts that someone in the image is cooking, the person in the image is actually a female, it's a woman. And obviously, if you think two seconds about it, it doesn't make any sense. Okay, because actually being a man or a woman has nothing to do with the activity that this person will do uh, in the picture. But this is a bias that the mo exists on the data set and that the model picks and exponentiates. Okay, and down the stream, if you will want to then to retrain your model, okay, because of the time dependencies that exist on your business, if you remember what we talked earlier, um, what will happen is not 67% of the people cooking are women, but 84, because that's the data that you collected in the meanwhile, okay, because that's what your algorithm uh, was telling to, and that, that's how you collected labels. And then if you feed that to, to, to a training regime of a machine learning method, what you learn is basically that if there is a woman on the picture, then it's cooking, okay? And this is like, as Redans on a model that has, has absolutely no value, is doing a nonsense. Okay, so we have to think how you will deal with this. If you 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 have uh, you want to have a machine learning model in 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 place, driving your business somehow, and um, do not stay hostage of it and not stay hostage of of the, the issues and the biases that this model may suffer. Okay, so now I will talk. Uh, go second part of my presentation, we'll talk about uh, a bit of Monedo and the solutions for some of the challenges that we'll have in Monedo. I'll just uh, use this, this moment to ask Sven if there are some questions uh, that I can answer about the first part of the presentation or if I should proceed to the second part. 
So far, we have no questions, but I think, okay, I think you can go on with the second part and we will just collect the questions. This just uh, shout out to everyone. You can collect questions <laughs> currently, and we will collect them in the chat uh, window and we will ask them, Louis, after the presentation. Great, great. Let's go ahead. Uh, I'll try to make it brief anyway. So, Monedo, we are there. We operate a consumer lending business. It is fully digital, so branchless, okay? Um, operating in four countries. And the very particular thing that attracted me about this company is that they scored more than 5 million individual applications and they lend more than 600 million euros uh, at a completely human-free fashion. So we do have a series of models that are comprising um, so together form an offer personalization engine that decides for each customer in a window of 60 seconds, uh, which is like if she should grant a loan or not, at which type of loan, with which interest, with which duration and so on, this customer should, should, uh, should get. Okay, so uh, this on the left is the the, the team that uh, uh, is helping me to, to 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 achieve that. All of us. Um, we have a lot of R and D topics with a lot of buzzwords here: auto ML, feature selection, affordability, survival analysis, reject inference. Um, okay, so a lot of topics. I, I, obviously, I cannot talk about all of these. I selected three. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk with you about this three, which issues they pose and how they connect to the, the, the seven deadly sins that we saw earlier today on this presentation. So now start with data gluttony. And of course, the one way to fight data gluttony is not to feed uh, all the data that you have inside of your model, but be selective about that. And one way of doing that is about selecting which decision variables should go on your model, which feature should go on your model. Of course, this is very easy if you have like 20 decision variables, you can, and a few hundreds of examples, you can do that, this in Excel yourself. But if you have classically a model in Monedo is fed with more than 4,000 features, so at scale, this is impossible. So we have to find an analytical way of doing that. And one way of doing that is, is, is on removing correlated features. So features that have, uh, uh, relationship between themselves. Um, although some machine learning models cope well with high correlated features, even without uh, doing this removal. However, uh, if you go to remove those, you will decrease the training time of your model and the complexity. So, and if you do this, you decrease the resources that your model will need to operate. So it will be easier to operate. It will be a simpler model, so more interpretable, uh, easier to deploy, easier to monitor, easier to track his decisions so that all pluses that uh, uh, will obviously push you to, 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 to a, try to attempt that. And when you think about correlation using these three based models, you typically experiment with the choice um, so Spearman is very sim very similar to Pearson correlation, which is linear correlation. And the idea is to find, uh, so to understand how much to, if you look to two features, let's imagine again the pair between income and, uh, and uh, the credit bureau rating, uh, how, so how much there it's, it's likely them to rank our examples in a similar way. Okay, so it's all about ranking. And that's this is good to go with trees because that's what trees do. So trees typically go to build themselves with entropy based criteria. And this entropy based criteria, what they try to do basically is something like follow. They they order your feature for let's say the income. Okay, and then they try to understand which is the cut. Uh, that will are uh, able to 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 do, for instance, which is the cut in income above which all the customers typically repay their loan. Okay, let's say that the algorithm is able to find something like above five thousand euros. Everybody that have a salary above five thousand euros per month repays their loans all the time. That if you have between five thousand and two point five, they have a chance of eighty percent of repaying and so on and so forth. So because of this behavior of the trees, Spearman uh, explores the same rank 
and that's a, a good way to go. However, um, it's not it's not it's not a great solution all in all. And in order for you to, to illustrate you why it's not a great solution, I brought here a synthetic generated example, which means that this data is not actually real data. So we which we have two features, very simple example, a red feature and the blue feature. And uh, the red feature is this very nice and continuous feature. Uh, both are uh, follow normal distribution. So this very nice Gaussian bell that we are always seeing um, out there. And uh, but the difference is the blue feature there is somehow ordinal. So we have these staircase steps that you see there, um, but they're very similar with the red. Okay. And then there is the binary target variable. Let's imagine, for the sake of our example, that is the the what able is able to distinguish between a customer be good or bad if it will repay or not repay the loan in time. Um, and that. We design model this target variable to follow the the blue feature, okay, in a linear fashion. In a linear fashion, so where for each level, so if level is higher, the probability of repaying is also higher, okay. So the Spimer correlation coefficients to these of these two features is 0 0.98 out of one. So they are very much correlated. And one of the things that that uh, Spearman has and Pearson also has is that they are symmetric, right? So the correlation from A to B is the same from B to A. So typically what you do, you remove either A or B because they are interchangeable, okay? Um, and uh, what I want to do first was to test which is the predictive power of each feature, okay? Using a technique that is an area under curve, uh, which is the area under these two curves, this red and blue curve in this second picture. And they are pretty much the same thing, okay? Uh, up to a second decibel case, they, they are almost the same thing. However, I did a another experiment. So I trained a random forest only with the red feature and only with the blue feature. And then I went to observe the AUC on unseen, uh, unseen examples, like in the previous figure. And I've noticed that actually, the model with the red figure have a better performance, okay? And I try to understand, okay, so um, why is this happening? Um, is this poor luck because I'm generating the numbers out of random? So I run the experiment 100 times, and uh, if you can see, so this is the density of the the, the, the AUCs, and you can clearly see that the the so the mean of the models that use the blue feature is lower than the mean that the model that use the red feature. So it's not it's it's not out of luck. So if you even if you run a statistical test out of this, it'll tell you that these two di distributions differ significantly. Um, so the problem is that the correlation coefficients are, are, are symmetric, okay? Where decision trees favor continuous features. Okay, so what what we end up we design an alternative to this, which is it's a symmetric Hanke coefficient. That basically what happens is that it tries to it's a method that tries to predict A based on B and vice versa. So it tries to assess if feature A can be safely replaced by B. Okay. And the results in our data um, are asymmetric, obviously. And they say that yeah, we could remove blue and keep red. But not the other way around. Okay, so and this is uh, something uh, very, very important uh, that you have at hand, a method like this, because this will allow you to uh, get rid of data gluttony, but in a safely, safely way. Okay. Second thing I want to talk is about greedy customers and how to to manage these to go around the classical stated income. Which is a problem for uh, for banking and particularly for for lower business, and so what we try to do that by doing something very different from banks traditionally do. So banks traditionally use an heuristic such as debt burden ratio. They try to understand which are your expenses, which are your um, your uh, revenues, and try to make a ratio out of this which. It's the ratio, um, the maximum ratio that they can safely 
uh, lend money to you. Okay, so the, the maximum ratio that you can achieve in terms of of capacity of debt that you can support. Okay, so we instead of doing this, we try to model with a machine learning model that take, of course, the income and the debt burden of the customer, but also um, so use data from similar customers, living expenses, data from government sources, data from bank transactions as well, from telco. And we try to, to formulate it as a survival uh, a problem with like a lot of different types of data. I'll not entail that. The approach we use is uh, random survival forests, which is basically type of decision tree model that have these survival curves in the end, which will say for different amounts that you are thinking on lending to your customers, which is the probability of default that this specific customer will have. Okay. And in order to make it work, we needed to, to make a series of tricks. Okay. Trick number one is label transformation. So typically in survival problems, we have this height sensor problem. So let's imagine that when you lend 100 euros to a customer and he repays back to you, you know that if you would lend him 80 or 50, he would repay, but you don't know if you will lend him 150 or 200 that if you repay or not. And this is the sensor part. So we know what happens until that amount. But when in the other in the other end, you lend the same 100 euros to a customer and it defaults, you cannot assume that he if you grant him 80 or 90 or 70, he would not default. Okay, you don't have this information. Okay, to find a way to 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 based on uh, on uh, how it was his repayment behavior until he defaulted, on uh, how to estimate this and transform our problem into a problem that can be used by the machine learning model. Of course, if we changed our labels, we can't use the traditional methods that are used to evaluate this. So we devised a way to have a business-centered uh, evaluation framework, evaluation sandbox that allow us to select, in this case, which is the best cutoff for the model to operate uh, that will guarantee largest profit um, uh, on, on, the, on the portfolio level. Okay. Um, and we were super happy because this model was looking that, was promising like a, a shift, an increase of 30%. Um, in terms of um, profit, uh, so everybody was very happy. But then <laughs> we realized, uh, we looked to the model, and the model had 150 gigabytes. Okay, and the response time was 1.2 seconds. So it was impossible to put this in production and, and to maintain it. Will be like absolutely crazy from the resource uh, point of view. So we went from being very proud to be very sad. And the message here is there is no free lunch and there are no supermen, okay? So the solution to that, okay, this is slide has a lot of details, but the solution to that was for us to find a way on uh, the, to optimize the way our model learns in a way that it's not, that not necessarily is the most accurate, okay? but it's the, the meets the best trade-off between the accuracy that he has and the business uplift and the resources it uses okay and in this slide i have for details or if you guys are, want to to dive deep on that after presentation more than happy to go okay so and then after doing this um we were able to deploy and to enjoy increase of profits not 30 percent but still enough to to, to party okay so finally, and really to, to, to end, talking about the bias on machine learning and how to handle that. So in, the, in banking, we have the bias of, of the, the accept and reject. So we have a scorecard that is accepting customers and only for those, we will collect repayment behavior. And obviously then when we go later to retrain the model, we will have uh, repayment behavior only for parts of the customers and that will amplify a bias towards better customers. So then the model will not know what to do when it's faced with a very bad customer and that, that creates problems on model performance. This problem is known as, as a sample bias problem, okay? 
And of course, sample bias problem hurts. Okay, and hurts more uh, as more as longer times uh, as more you need to go into the loop. It's each iteration of the loop. This problem gets more, and you can see this in this picture that actually the gap increases with the number of times that you need to retrain your models. So we devise here uh, um, uh, a framework called an algorithm that's called shallow self-learning. So the algorithm based on on three stages, but I'll, I'll explain you. I'm more interested on explaining you the base idea. So the base idea is uh, it, it tries to explore similarities on the rejected cases, between the rejected cases and the accepted cases, and then to try to label the reject, to infer what will be the repayment behavior of these customers, okay? And add these guys to the training pool and enter here on the loop where you are labeled, labeling cases or inferring repayment behavior and then extending the your knowledge and the, the data that you have. Of course, by doing this, you are actually introducing errors, noise in your data and the labels that you use. But uh, we have then safety mechanisms to tell how grid we can go safely, okay? So then that's the, the, the main idea here, okay? We have this loop that is iteratively augmenting, it's called also uh, uh, data augmentation, or augmenting your training set in the way that the training set suffers from less bias. The model will be weaker on the data that they know, but then when it goes to production, will be stronger than simply ignoring all the unlabeled examples. Okay. I can also go back to this and talk in more detail if there are uh, questions about this. So this work was was published last year on ACML PKDD, which is basically the the most relevant, most prestigious uh, European conference on on machine learning in Europe. Um, so we did some evaluation here in some cases uh, from Monedo, so uh, some accepts and some, some rejects, okay? And then we also had a series of baseline cases, so that is also very common, that we, we accepted all the applications for some time, okay? And then we keep this as baseline, okay? So a, a set of applications where we have, for all of them, we have repayment behavior. And when we compare like our approach with all approaches that exist out there, we see a small uplift, okay, in terms of, of, of AUC and partial AUC. Uh, you may wonder, is this significant? It is significant, but then is this significant from a business point of view? We went to do the maths and the potential gains from SSL with reject inference um, could go up to, to $1 million. Okay, I would say at least for Boredo, that's uh, very significant and uh, uh, sufficient to to simply not ignore the problem. And this this is particularly important if you have if you accept a low percentage uh, of your customers. That's what happened with us. Uh, perhaps less relevant if you are a traditional banking, which most of your customers are so-called prime and then you accept 80% of the customers, then uh, that's actually applied to you. So then uh, then that's, uh, th this phenomenon is less important. But in our case, it's, it's, it's pretty relevant. So I reach to the end, some final remarks. So for you guys to take before we go to the pieces and to the beers, uh, size and scale do not matter, performance does. Um, and I would say also, resource to do and careful with what you wish for about having machine learning you may end up having it but not being what you dream about data scientists are unicorns but good business is also a great unicorn and make a dollar is also a great unicorn so keep that message in mind uh, don't follow the hype customers are unreliable expect that okay so don't rely on your customers to provide provide you data about them have uh, the necessary data governance protocols in place to and safety measures to, to, to guarantee that you have minimum of data quality before going to automation. Um, because data quality standards. And of course, tools are as good as their users. Machine learning is no exception. There is no free lunch. So there is no Bob to help to throw all the data and then 
forget about your business. And sample bias is a big problem if you have machine learning models in production doing decisions for you, but reject inference can help you out a bit. Okay. So if you want more, let's talk about the virtual coffee or if using Sven's jargon, some beers and some pieces. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Luis. So we have our first questions from the audience. Um, you may stop sharing your screen or just. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I will do that. And this. yeah. OK. Uh, the first question uh, is What is the time frame of the evaluation of the models in productions? Defaulting usually takes a, a while, so you will not know how well your model works right away since data distribution should change over time, especially with something like Corona. Right. Uh, so if you want to do, you, you have to look to evaluation two ways. You can do it supervised and unsupervised, right? So, and unsupervised, you can do it right after um, your model goes into production, okay? So you don't need you don't actually need the labels to understand. So for instance, if you have if you did evaluated your model uh, with all doubt, you have a distribution for the scores of your model, right? And these you expect the distribution of the output of your model when you go to production looks similar to that, okay? And that you don't need to wait three months to get labels to understand that something is terrible home of your model, because if you look to the score distributions, you will realize that. And the same, who says the score distribution says distribution of the features as well, or even um, how different, uh, how different parts, different, if you had customers prototypes, you can understand how different, how the model reacts to different to different customers, okay, that you are obtaining in production. For that, you don't need labels. But it's true that time is not our friend, and when uh, we want labels, we need to wait um, a few months, uh, depending on the product, right? So installment loans, it will be a few months. If it will be my micro loans or payday loans, it will be something like 15 to 30 days um, to get labels and start looking into that, yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Luis. This was an excellent talk. And uh, so the, the great thing about uh, hosting the event is that you can also ask questions yourself. And so I would like to make use of that. And um, so actually when I, I, I heard you talking and you started to, to talk about AI, actually I thought that you would end somewhere completely different. And uh, one of my colleagues um, uh, once said to me when we when we were chatting on the floor, that uh, AI is the reinvention of statistics with very inefficient methods. And actually, I thought that's where you want to go in the end. And uh, I'm, I'm not sh quite sure actually whether you wanted to say that, but uh, to come up with a concrete question, what I wanted to ask you is whether you would say, once you have discovered, let's say a latent variable or like a concrete variable, like with the methods you suggested, for instance, would it make sense to you to go back to traditional statistics and just be much more efficient in terms of computation in predicting loan defaults, for instance? You, you know what I mean? Like you, you could go back and say like, you know, you discovered a new variable which was latent before, but now I use a traditional log it or prob it model or a survival uh, model like uh, proportional hazard models or something like this because it's just more efficient to do so. So, so I, I'm really I'm I'm not on the jargon war, right? So I don't say this is AI, this is machine learning, this is statistics, this is no. I just use the tool that is more at hand, uh, right? I love logistic regression models. I think they are they are they are great tools. They they are the backbone of this, and I, I love it. And I don't like when people people try to see machine learning now is all neural networks. No, I mean for me, uh, linear models are machine learning. Okay, so uh, okay, parametric models are machine learning. Okay, and I, I use the tool that is most uh, most at hand. And uh, I have to say, linear models, GCN models, is something that is used on the daily basis in in our company now. The thing here is that, I mean, the amount of, inf of data that you have at hand is very, is very large and is very rich. 
and it's extremely time can be extremely time consuming to construct the features or the latent variable because you will not have a scorecard from one latent variable, right? You have from at least 20, even with classical statistical approach. Okay, so at least go, good 20. Yeah. So in order to make usage of all the data that you have available, all the signals that you have available, and crunch them into those 20 variables that would work just nice with logistic model, that's very time consuming, okay? And uh, machines, machine time is cheaper than humans, okay? So we sometimes, we, as data scientists, uh, what we are doing is let the put the machine doing the work for us, okay? On finding the, the on finding the 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 best representation of the data that will allow the algorithm to 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 perform better and to be accurate and deployable at the same time and if that will be a linear model so be it okay because the the applications uh, if, if not if it's a decision tree fine if it's a neural network fine as well so yeah that's my answer to you Maybe I can uh, maybe I can just directly uh, strive into that because uh, I was asking myself uh, you have a lot of projects that you have to cope with and yet that you have to try to prioritize. Um, what is your uh, general approach there? How do you calculate your, the return on investment for a particular project? And also, how do you prioritize? Do you prioritize based on ROI or what are your criteria for that? So uh, that's a very good question. Um, for us, it all comes down to business. Okay, so prioritization uh, is made um, in terms of. So we run in our team. We run the the, the sprint in an agile fashion. And what we do in terms of there is obviously in agile there there is prioritization, but most important than that is is. Uh, on the agile, so agile works. It's about feedback, getting feedback from your peers as soon as possible, and then depending on how much you believe this potential of a certain pro mini project of a certain idea will have in terms of making impact on your business, you may grant this project more resources and less resources, okay? And this you do it based on your own experience, right? So I do know that, for instance, okay, we talk about this reject inference problem. I do know that reject inference will be more important as low it's uh, as lower is the acceptance rate on a certain market. So if I have a product on a certain market which has an acceptance rate of 5%, Okay, projects that come about reject inference on this market, believe me, will be critical. But if we look into a market where we are more relaxed and we're accepting 20, 30% of the customers, perhaps that will will get back to backlog. Okay, so so it comes out of uh, our experience on uh, on which threads we believe that can make the most of impact, most of the times on the shortest time frame of time frame as possible, so as soon as possible, okay. Okay, another question I, I popped in my mind was, uh, you also talked right at the beginning about uh, legal requirements and how this is actually stopping all the good ideas because, you know, first you're excited and, you know, and then the, the law steps in and you think, oh, well, before I comply with all of this stuff, you know, like I, I don't start at all potentially. And I was wondering, I mean, once you have trained your, your algorithms, I mean, two things that, that I would be interested in is like, first of all, how can you ensure that they comply with new le regulatory requirements? Let's say, for instance, in, in the insurance world, like, you know, you could discriminate or you could for a long time discriminate between men and women. And then you couldn't anymore for a, at a certain point in time. And, you know, as an economist, I would say actually it makes sense to discriminate because it helps to predict and it also it, it helps to to, you know, discriminate between good and bad risks. And my question would be, how do you make sure that your algorithms comply? And the second question is like, do you discriminate algorithms uh, for different uh, regions uh, where you extend loans? Uh, because, you know, what might work, uh, for instance, in India might not work in Russia. So do you have a different algorithm for each country? 
Yeah. Okay. So, I, I, I you made two questions, but I sent three there. Um, okay, and I will. I'll try to. I'll try to go for that. So, the, what I see is the following. So, so many people as business plans, they talk about AI and talk benefits of AI of, on automation. Okay, how I can scale fast because I'll be this is automated. How I can not have, for instance, costs with customer care because I have a bot, so chatbot to do that. So I can reduce OPEX and so on. But they forget the dependence relationship. So there is a cost for AI. Okay, so there is a cost there, and uh, and they when they realize it's too late. It's when you scaled and you have all these problems with so-called technical debt to deal with. And by then it's already too late and too complex. There are a lot of protocols already in place in the company. There is a culture of the company already there. And uh, it's easy to change machines, but it's hard to change people. Okay. So even if you start hiring the best data scientists in the world, they will struggle because the way you collect data, the way you process data, the protocol that you have in different teams to work on that, all of these will have an influence on how the model works. So besides you have a business plan, nowadays you have to have a data plan. You have to have a data governance plan to, to, to drive you and to make sure that you are not hostage of the model, such, for, for, such as, for instance, now that I cannot use gender to <laughs> decide, uh, well, I'll shut down business. Okay, because the new model that I train has no performance. So perhaps I shouldn't even have started to, to work on this geography with machine learning models. Okay, because the, these guys can from day to night change regulations and put these like that. So this is my answer to, to my first question is uh, to the first question I felt encapsulated there. It's very important for, that you have nowadays a business plan but the data plan as well, data governance plan, um, to think what will happen if, okay? Uh, in order to be successful and get there, get to the exit that you want, raise the equity that you want, uh, be, get a healthy growth and not a paid growth, uh, uh, equity paid growth of your customer base that you want. Uh, second question you made still on the first question, is that how you ensure that the model follows a specific legislation? Okay, um, this is is a this is I falls in, into interpretability. That's a big trend on on, on the machine learning community. They even some people call XAI, which is explainable AI. It's another it's another uh, fancy name. Uh, to to discuss things that are here for years, but uh, I'll, uh, let's let them do that uh, for the sake of doing. Um, these actually there are a series of methods that, and many of them re uh, rely to uh, to linear methods um, to that are able to explain how the model is using the the, the data that has it hand and how the model is making decisions. Okay, and I believe these these methods that are getting out there will be in the future part of the regulation. So while perhaps 10 years ago, it, and perhaps even today, in many countries, will be very difficult for you to explain that you have a non-linear model to decide uh, loans because that's what regulators are expecting you to have. Um, I believe in 10 years' time, you will need to have this or this type of explanation, and this to be, will be hard coded because, well, business uh, with the amount of data that you have, the way that business will be done by then uh, will be super automated and super data driven, and you need to have models that can cope with that data, but that you can actually still control. So uh, this is a this, that's a big topic, and again. Uh, we are doing some things on that uh, on that direction, but uh, that that I think it's the standards are still to come and they will come. It's something that 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 will come on on the regulators as well, because they also need to fo to follow the business, okay, uh, even if they don't like it sometimes. Um, the third question, I say uh, different algorithms. Uh, I wouldn't say different algorithms, but different models for sure. Realities in different countries are, are very, even for, from product to product, realities are very different. So if you have a POS model, a POS business, so a business where you, uh, 
uh, for people that may be on the line, a business uh, where you lend money for you to buy a smartphone on an e-commerce website. And you do this almost without interest um, because what you want is to, to cross sell from there to other more interesting products for you, such as uh, installment loans or, or, or other, other loans with higher interest. Um, the type of customers that will search this type of loan will be completely different than the type of customer that search a payday loan with a loan with a huge interest where you get a very small amount of money and you have to repay in two weeks. Okay, so these two customer beds are completely different. And then the things that you need to look at for the customer uh, overall will be the same, but the weights you give to, to these decision variables and the importance they'll have will be completely different. So yes, for sure, a model, a mo different models per markets and different different models even per products, yeah. So Luis, I think res with, with respect to the time, uh, I have one last question for you, and that is um, maybe within the scope of Bremen AI and the data launch as well, touching the two last points that you stated with your seven sins, and they touched on first the list of the data scientists uh, and what they are doing, what the resource are, are providing for the companies, but also the companies that are trying to get into machine learning. So basically um, adoption of machine learning in the industry. So how do you think uh, in which state we are currently with the adoption uh, from a higher perspective in uh, in the industry, what, what concerning machine learning or real machine learning and not this uh, PowerPoint uh, AI stuff. Um, and as well, uh, on a general perspective and as well different maybe from in Germany and in other countries like China or, U or the US. Okay, so, so it's difficult to, well, I'll start with the last question. It's difficult to compare Germany to China and the US because uh, the magnitude uh, of the country is completely different. It's, it's easier to compare Europe to, to China and to, 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 to US. And my opinion about Europe in, uh, in general, uh, Europe doesn't fall behind. It. Europe falls, falls much, much, much behind what is the reality of uh, the, the adv technology advancement on AI that you have either in China or in the US. And the funny reason is that I read a very recent report uh, made uh, to the European Union. The funny reason is that it was detected that we have more talent than US and, and China per capita, okay? So that's not surprising for me, uh, but these guys made a very nice nice job with a lot of figures and a lot of citations to prove this point. So so that's, it's very, very, if, if you give it a thought, uh, a first thought, it's very hard to understand, but if you give a second thought, you can understand very easily what happens is the in the investment point of view, um, that the risk, that you need to take, uh, it's way higher than the risk that typically European venture capitalists are willing to, to take. So in the US, uh, you typically get, it's much more easier to, to get, get money at scale than it is in Europe in general. Uh, and in China, the same thing, even if in China, the type of initiatives have, um, I would say, uh, are more control environment, let's say this way, but they have a lot of capital indeed. Uh, and the, the companies have access to this capital. So it's easier to make midterm bets because make no mistake, the bet on the, on the automation, it's a midterm long-term bet and you need to go over the staircase or it will fall down and you will crash completely um, with your head in the staircase in the meanwhile. So that's that's what I think now answering particularly about uh, Germany. Germany has a lot of talent, has a lot of uh, first attracts a lot of talent from 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 southern countries. Uh, over here, I, I, I'm putting myself humbly on the the bag of talent uh, coming from Portugal, but also people from Spain, from Italy, from Greece. You see them here, um, and they're very top universities. Okay, and. Uh, uh, mentioned uh, here uh, Tubingham, so 
it's referees institute to berlin referees institute to dortmund referees institute uh, i'm sure that in bremen it also exists uh, very nice people working there so in general this is, is there um then there is a lot of people working but uh, in the industry um then if sometimes what happens here is what happens also in uh, most of Europe, we have still this mixture between citizen data scientist, professional data scientist, data engineer. Um, we have some roles for data science that are start. I see, okay, technologies, a series of technologies that I never heard of, and then I realize, okay, this is this is data engineering things heavy um, label that data scientist. This is still a reality on the German market. So, because companies actually don't know what they are looking for, they don't know the value proposition of data science, um, and this is uh, they don't have the data plan there, they don't have the data strategies there, so in place, and then then it's only we only enter when they want to scale, but which is okay because that's when they have actually the funding to do that. Uh, so that comes. So typically, the true data scientists come to a company when they have Series A or Series B. That's that's what when the professional data science reach to to a company. But most of the time, they lack the plan. So they have that problem. That there are a lot of process in place. How they collect data, how they protocols, how to deal with that. That then will really make life difficult for data scientists. They will join regardless of their talent. Okay, so that, that's my picture. Thank you very much for that opinion. Um, so we are on point uh, 1930. Uh, again, thank you very much for your interesting talk uh, and again for your for your view on certain topics that we had in, in our